Okay, so welcome to Retech and the ongoing saga of the BBC Micro. Um, if you've kind of saw my last episode, or even the one before that, we've covered um, trying to get one of these machines working, and I kind of did a bit of a part swap around just to get one of them working because I want to do a MIDI based BBC Micro episode but um you know as, as i said before things didn't quite go to plan um i got two machines eventually running but this is the the stubborn one here and it's the one that's been causing me quite a lot of problems so i'm going to have a look at why this machine isn't starting up and i've got quite a bit of kit kicking about here um and this is what kind of happens long nights massive manual um of how the BBC was actually put together. So the bits of kit that I'd normally start off with was a multimeter and a logic probe, which you might be able to see here. And they're two kind of basic bits of kit. The, the other part is the manual and <laughs> the ubiquitous mobile phone, just to look up different ideas if we can't get it running. Um, and also lots of coffee and other kind of caffeinated type drinks really to keep you going and that's what I've been doing for the last maybe five or six hours trying to get this machine to work and you may be able to see a oscilloscope here and um, I've got a digital, an all digital oscilloscope um, and it runs off of this laptop which you can see on top of it um, but I've actually found I get better results with this one uh, and I'm kind of using the laptop now for reference so yeah there's quite a bit of kit out here um, so let's go through see what I've gone through and check to try and get this machine working and let's see if we can get it actually running Okay, so first off, we're going to do some simple checks using a, a multimeter here, a digital multi multimeter, just to make sure everything's connected right. I've got a feeling that this, there's a 5 volt rail which isn't doing what it should do. So, we're going to take a basic multimeter and we're just going to check the voltages across here. And I've got, yeah, 4.92, 4.82, fluctuates a little bit, but it's not far off, so that shouldn't be causing any issues. So we're going to put these connectors back down again. And we're going to do the same across here. And again, fluctuating a little bit, but still we've got the correct voltage there. So the next job is to check the other two as well, just to make sure we're on the same page. Yeah, roughly about right. So shouldn't really cause any massive issues. And the last one is I'm going to use this same earthing point here. And we got, yeah, bang on five. So it looks like the voltage is getting through to the board. So it's not a voltage problem with the board itself. So that rules out the power supply, which I actually know is good because I've rebuilt the power supply and that one's a, basically a reconditioned power supply that's been put in this machine anyway. So that proves that this works the way it should do. And we've got a fault somewhere along the lines. Now, I've actually taken out all of these processes and um, I've swapped them as well. Um, that hasn't made any difference, but it's not to say that there's a fault with these, any of these, either the ROMs, the um, the processor itself, the ULA, or anything else that's on the board that could be causing problems. So this is what we're going to try and have a look at. So here are a set of ROMs and processors, etc., that I've actually swapped out from this machine, trying to find out originally just a quick way of finding out if there's a fault with this, but it really doesn't mean that there isn't a fault. Now we know the rails are good, which is a good thing. What can stop these machines from booting and displaying basically rubbish on if that was a monitor could be this series of ICs here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check the actual data coming to these ICs themselves. So 
we could use this but that only basically tells you if there's any kind of data coming to any pulses but I want to see it visually so I'm going to use the oscilloscope to do that my initial thought and as you can see the camera uh, at the bottom just trying to help you see it because obviously these writing on this doesn't always get picked up by the camera itself so I'm using this to magnify it is the SN74 and um, these do go bad and what happens is then they won't boot properly so it could be literally one of a bank on this machine you can see them there's quite a number of them now they when they go bad stop booting so what I've done is I've set the oscilloscope up just to give uh, a static image really so you can see it and we're going to check out one of the first ICs on here but the strangest thing we've got is we have a soldered in unit which I'm always a bit wary of so reset the power just to get a nice clean image on here and you can start to see as I work my way up the pins them actually forming actually they're performing no connect on that one so we shouldn't get and we have data running through in fact we have nice clean data running through we have pulses running through these chips although we do have a dead one yep we definitely have one which is dead okay so so far I've found one that's not getting any feed yep they're fine so we have one that's not getting any pulses whatsoever okay so it looks like we've got a, a minor fault um, on this part of the board just here but um, I'm not quite convinced that's the only fault so I'm not really convinced so I'm going to check out the 6502 um, because on its own um, a failure here wouldn't really cause the machine not to really display anything but rubbish so I've got a funny feeling we have a, a problem so you can probably see here I've got um just over here I have the um, diagram of what the waveform should look like on the pinouts on the 6502 so I'm going to check that out now so again recycle the power so that's correct that is okay that's correct that's getting that's also fine that should be exactly where the, there is a little bit dirty that signal that one's correct all right so hmm that one's not now no that, that's a bit on the dirty side but it's also triggering that's actually triggering quite nice so I've got a funny feeling and those are correct just let me work my way down again absolutely spot on that one oh okay so we've got a double got noise on these two that one yeah fine so we've got we're getting picking up noise and it's something that shouldn't be there
Right, okay, I'm just going to check these again because I think we're picking up noise across the the processor. Hmm. Yeah, okay. It appears that... Yeah, that's fine. It appears that this is actually starting, starting to break down, okay? I just want to check the. Just want to see. Oh, okay. Now that's a bit odd. Um, it's not what I was expecting on that. Okay, so it appears we have ghosting across the CPU, but also we have a very warm pro uh, IC here, which has in the last few minutes subsequently failed. Yep, and it's also corrupted every data line coming in and out and past the, the CPU as well. So I think we've found the fault, and the fault is this. That's causing the fault. That's actually causing the processor to ghost. I'm going to change the CPU anyway. Um, and I don't think these are actually causing any issue, because I actually think that's the cause of this. Okay, so I kind of think it's this here, the VC2023. I think that's causing the problems. It's not massively red hot, but it is getting warmer on the bottom. And I think that that really needs to be changed. As you can see, it's been a bit of a long kind of slog to try and find out what the problem with this machine was. Um, basically, what you saw was just the conclusions rather than, you know, the, the actual problem hopefully you can actually see the the machine actually functioning properly now because of what i've done is i've swapped all the components out that we need to so we have potentially a working machine now luckily the the processors and the chips were all in sockets and uh, it was easy enough to change out but using a multimeter on its own kind of didn't show up the fault because I'd spent about five or six hours um, searching across the board with initially the multimeter which is kind of the first thing you do check the voltages find out if any lines are broken check continuity and you know basically make sure that all the the power pins on each IC is getting the correct voltage which it was fine. So really, once you've done that, that's as far as you can really go with a multimeter. Now, the next step, as you saw, was checking the actual data or the, the, the actual sine waves that were coming out from each CPU. So what you need to do is be, be able to find out what's actually happening on each pin. And the only way you can do that really is with um, an oscilloscope. You can kind of do it with um, a logic probe, but it doesn't give you the waveform. So you don't really know if um, the logic probe's actually reporting it correctly. It's a good indicator, but it doesn't give you the detail um, of even a classic multimeter does. So that's where I've got to. I know this board works. Um, as a precaution though, I'm going to swap out some of the memory anyway when I've got it in pieces. And um, I'm going to make sure that I refurbish everything that I need to refurbish on this board. But, but the biggest reason why these machines are ending up in the parts pin is because it's very, very difficult to try and work through, especially when you have manuals, which I'll reach around and grab. Um, 
that are in effect hundreds of pages long and the problem is um, you probably not be able to see but each test has a program a basic program for most of them so for example if you wanted to test out the circuitry for the sound you'd be advised to run a basic program but if your machine doesn't work then you have to try and follow what each pin is meant to do and which is you know things like this and as you can see as you can work through it they all have different waves different graphs but having known that um, each component and each capacitor and each resistor and each IC having known exactly why they're there on the board which is what this list is all about really does put things into perspective along with a ge genuine circuit diagram so there's quite a lot to go through and it wasn't a 10 minute fix some I know some videos make it look like it was a 10 minute fix but it was actually hours and hours and hours and I just showed you what the eventuality was because sitting looking at a video of basically what's going on with each pin for hours on end isn't really good to watch but having a shortened version where they show you the results is a nice way of basically saying you can do this yourself but be prepared to sit there for hours on end trying to get it to work. This has now got me thinking you're going to wonder how much effort people are going to put into repairing these machines. Um, there's going to be a point where the parts for these machines are not going to be available and the processors are not going to be available and the memory chips are not going to be available and just about anything on these boards is getting quite rare quite long in the tooth even finding decent 6502 processors or Z80s Z80s aren't so bad because they're still being produced but only in mainly in the non-dip package but you can still get them but you know Processors like this, 68,000s on some machines, 6502s, SID chips, PLAs, ULAs, especially ULAs, um, they're getting hard to get hold of. The only reason I can fix this machine is because I have the parts, I have the spares, but I'm kind of very, very rapidly running out of spare parts for these machines, especially for the BBCs. They were very well engineered. In fact, basically a little bit over engineered for the uses they were put to at the time but they also have their Achilles heel which is failing capacitors especially in power supply units failing processors failing ULAs because these do have a ULA failing everything really to be honest especially the proprietary chips and processors and ICs which you won't find anywhere else you know the Acorn branded uh, hardware on these machines and I think with the advent of people producing motherboards for simpler machines such as the Mattel Aquarius, the Commodore 64s and the likes it's a great way of keeping them going but Machines such as the more complex and complicated BBC, I very much doubt we're ever going to see a full replacement PCB for these machines. Um, so really, I think if you're hunting around on places like eBay and you're hunting around on other auction sites and retro sites, you're probably very wise to grab a few spares if you've got one of these to keep them running a little bit longer and, you know, get what you can keep it in good condition and hopefully you might never need it but you know the odds are you're going to need at least one part during the lifetime of these machines or the remaining lifetime of these machines so let's hope we can keep these going for at least another decade or two so now the bbc micro is running my next job is to basically reassemble it with the best parts of my spares kit um and I've got a couple of nice keyboards there and also some very nice cases. So I'm going to basically use the best parts to put this machine together. So I'm just going to put it together and we'll get it powered up and we'll see it hopefully running on the bench. Okay, so this is the machine back together. It's just a 32K machine. That's it. Um, 
just checking is <laughs> I actually didn't check to see if the um, DF, the Acorn disc filing system was working or not because I literally just put the chip in and put the case on and you've got basically um, a bit of a mix and match machine you have um, a revision 7 board with a slightly later keyboard um, it's got the the steel backing on it and you've got two parts of the case which actually belong to two different machines but um, they're in very good condition both top and bottom there's no real color difference between them um, the original one had school kind of scroll put in it um, you know from obviously the machine was used as a school machine at some point so I was quite happy to put a case on that didn't really have any marks on it from uh, its previous life so we have a working BBC micro it's not doing a lot at the moment um, it's relatively quiet as well it doesn't have much of the old speaker hiss um, and um, It'd be nice just to use this machine for the the MIDI or the music or the comparison between the 8 and the 16 bit era for as far as music's concerned. So I wouldn't have been able to do it without this. Not a chance. This was really a lifesaver, this manual, because you know you can kind of poke around in the dark as much as you want, um, doing basically best guesses, educated guesses, but without that manual written by the Acorn guys at the time, um, you would be struggling. And this is where Acorn was very good at making its documentation and actually making it relevant and its documentation does work and it's almost 100% spot on across most of the revisions of the boards. So it's very well received and it's an addition I'm actually going to keep in paper form as well as on the laptop because using a laptop to keep referencing backwards and forwards is a bit of a pain or a tablet whereas flicking through a bit of paper making your notes on the side scribbling on it it's kind of easier at times so there we go one working BBC Model B and for most people's eyes it looks like an original machine and that's the whole idea it's used original parts from the era but it's not exactly the machine that left the factory but it's close enough I hope it's been uh, informative and I hope um, it was something you know you'd like to try yourself but um, as I say it was five hours of head scratching reading manuals and searching to get to the conclusions I got to so you know it's not a five minute job but enjoy it if you like this kind of thing and um, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you'll subscribe and I hope to see you soon so thanks for watching and it means we can get on with the MIDI side of the BBC Micro or the music side of it very shortly so thanks for watching I'll see you soon